Good morning for you. Yes, good morning. Um, I think uh, judging by the names that I see on this list, most of our participants are from Latin America as well. So good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm here in Germany at this moment. It's uh, 6 p.m. here. Uh, for those, uh, we have some people from India and uh, uh, Pakistan with us. So good evening for this one. Um, it's very good to see all of you here with us today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Lilian Krug. I am the scientific coordinator of POGO. POGO is an international organization uh, dealing with ocean observation and increasing capacity building on this matter, among other activities. Uh, one of our efforts is um, to support our alumni, our uh, former scholars, in uh, the network called NANO. Among several activities of NANO, we have this global project uh, called, um, uh, it has a, a, a long name, a global study of productivity, deoxygenation, and ocean acidification. Uh, we have uh, participants, uh, well, we have Adriana with us here. She's uh, one of the coordinators of this project. We have, uh, at the moment, 11 countries participating. Uh, so Peru, Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil in Latin America. And we also have Ghana, Tunisia, India, South Africa, Mauritius. And uh, very recently, we welcome uh, Cape Verde and Bangladesh as well. Um, so uh, the objectives of this project, of the Nano Global Project, it's uh, to, um, to promote in situ and remotely sensed observations in the ocean at selected coastal sites. So in, in all these uh, countries, we have representatives, former scholars joining us. Uh, so we can contribute to the global effort of monitoring ocean acidification and deoxygenation levels uh, in the ocean. Um, we also aim with this project to provide opportunities to participants to exchange experience and uh, develop uh, methods and standards together. And in one of these actions is to promote this series of webinars. We had our first a um, uh, few weeks ago with Dr. Milton Campbell from Brazil. Uh, he talked about uh, exploration of the Giovanni tool for chlorophyll and sea surface temperature. Um, we have recorded the webinar and we have also Dr. Campbell's presentation in our website. And soon, soon we will uh, publish um, the, the webinar as well, the recording. And today we, have, we are very happy that Dr. Ayon accepted our invitation. So, muchas gracias, Dr. Ayon. Um, he, uh, Dr. Ayon is from the University of Baja California, the Autonomous University of Baja California in Mexico. And he will talk a little bit about pH measurements for acidification studies, what to do with available data and methods. Uh, Dr. Ayon is an oceanographer uh, with doctoral studies in coastal oceanography at the School of Marine Sciences at the Autonomous University in Baja California and a postdoctoral fellow at Scripps in California. And he's a specialist in the carbon dioxide system in seawater in marine biogeochemistry. Um, so, uh, and he's a representative of Mexico in, in, in a lot of uh, groups like such as SOLAS and the Goa on network uh, for ocean acidification. So we couldn't have a better person to talk about acidification for us. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ayon. Um, I will leave it to you now. So uh, we uh, ask you to talk about 30 minutes and then uh, after your talk, we will open for questions for about 30 minutes as well, okay? So yeah, Dr. Ayon, whenever you you wish to start. 
We can see your screen already. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can see the screen with the, with the, with the presentation? Yes. You just uh, have to put it into presentation mode. And yes. OK, let me see. Thank you. I believe you can press F5, if I'm not mistaken. You see now? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, well, we, we can see uh, the view as you see in your screen with the next slide showing up, but it's okay. I mean... Just like that, is better? Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation, for the group, for the Nano, uh, for uh, Adriana also, who was talking with me about this interest. And, uh, and, and, this, and this morning for here and afternoon for the rest of the, of the world, uh, I have this opportunity with this uh, title that uh, you offered to me to ask me to, with the invitation to talk about the, the maybe people who, ha who have uh, some availability of data and want to know about these methods. Uh, the way that I would like to start is to tell you that you maybe need to, to, to know about a little chemistry. Let me see. Okay. And uh, you need a, a few tools, uh, a few tools that you, you need uh, just for to start. The people who want to um, be familiar with the ocean acidification needs to understand a little bit about the acid basis reaction that maybe we remember a little bit from the bacterial degree, especially the CO2. We need to know that uh, for the description of the different species of the CO2, uh, we have uh, four tools to measure pH, dissolving organic carbon, the, uh, the PCO2, and the total alkalinity. And uh, for the description of all the species that we need for to be in this, in this field, we need at least two. And with these two can be pH and total C2, pH and total alkalinity, the different combinations. And then we really need two. Uh, we, we are not able to do too much with only the one, one uh, parameter. And uh, another tool that you need, uh, you need a C2 cis, is uh, basically the equations, thing equation developed by Kilo Park in the 17th. That's uh, the combination that made us possible using only two variables plus salinity and temperature to develop the description of all the rest of the species. And finally, you need equipment, okay? You, you, you need this equipment to, uh, to measure these variables. And uh, uh, what I know, because you request, uh, you at least have the possibility to, to measure pH there are different uh, description of the best practices that you can get from this available book in case that you don't find it's, in, it's on the web but you can ask me by email I can send you of course no problem this is available for all the community who want to know uh, what's variables and how to measure and with the quality control okay but uh, we're going to go deep a little bit about this because uh, in reality, uh, I was thinking in your title that you invited me to talk because uh, I, I, I maybe guess that you have some data, uh, data available for you. And maybe you are thinking, well, we have some historical data that maybe we can use for uh, to see a trend or maybe I can use to understand the environment. That the topic that I want you to invite you to be thinking is, uh, you have this data, is first to be thinking in how they were measured. I mean, which technique they use. Uh, I invite you to, to be thinking about the quality control. The data that you have and were validated using a certificate reference material, how they were developed, how they were measured. Because on base of that, you can develop um, the uncertainty the availability, or this means the standard deviation is analogy that's certainly with the standard deviation to be able to compare with another, another areas. And uh, uh, no last but uh, important topic is in which pH scale you measure or this data were measured. 
maybe it's kind of weird for some of you to know that there are four scales, basically, for pH, uh, for, 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 that, for the pH. And then, then I, I can maybe answer a little bit about your future uh, answer about this question, because you maybe uh, remember that you use a couple of buffer solutions, the buffer for four and the buffer for seven, and then uh, you will be thinking, well, uh, I remember it was a, a yellow and a pink solutions that we use for that. Well, this kind of buffers is, uh, are, uh, or are related with the, the MBS National Bureau Standard Scale. And these standards are now developed for uh, the ocean. They were developed for fresh water. And then we start to be thinking, okay, about the methodology, about the quality control, where my, di my data come from. Okay, yes, uh, because I know that you're interested in, in ocean acidification. That the two techniques that are available in this moment for to measure the pH, and your left of your screen is you have the spectrophotometric, which is a pH sensitive indicator diet that you use for to measure the pH, and the potentiometric technique that is here represent, represented basically for the new electrodes for ISFETS technique. That's Atlantic and now Seabird is the company who are using these electrodes, potentiometric, which uh, they measure the difference of the electrical potential, basically. And uh, both of them are good. The, the spectro spectrophotometric we use in our lab for validate the measure that we can get from the potentiometric pH. And then we need this kind of two tools to be sure about our quality control. And uh, of course, using the trees or seawater buffer solution. We need to validate. The potentiometric only measure uh, millivolts. The colorimetric also me uh, they measure the sensitive indicator of ch changes in, abs in, in, a, in a web length, in absorbance. And then we need to calibrate, to put a number. We need these trees to, uh, or a certificate reference material to know the exactly value, or at least the most close accuracy that we are working on. There are several uh, advantages. Uh, you can see that advantage of the spectrometric, spectrophotometric is uh, very straightforward because the precision is very high, it's more expensive. They need uh, some hardware standards, but you can see the precision 0 0.001 or less, and the accuracy is about 0 0.002. If you move in this line to the potentiometric, you will, you will see some differences. The precision is not as good as the spectrophotometric, and the accuracy is not as good as the spectrophotometric. This means that we have a very good tool for the spectrophotometric, but the advantage of the potentiometric you will see is that you can measure in real time, and uh, the, uh, with the spectrophotometric is, for the moment, of course, there are uh, discrete samples, and now they are improved more about a system that can be used in a real time too. But, uh, of course, the the uh, disadvantage of the aspect of photometric is the price but when you get a good fund fundings uh, you can uh, don't forget about that don't, don't care about that okay the, com the comparison between this between these two techniques aspect of photometric or durafed you can see is an average minus plus 0 0.005 which is not, not so bad and this is this was set in a month of measuring done by, uh, done by uh, Todd Marks, they are so good. But the nice part of this is, uh, is to be thinking, well, which is my question about that? And then we're going to go deep a little bit about this because uh, and about your title and what to do with some data available, I invite you to be thinking and your question, okay? And then we go there. For example, some considerations about the, the CO2. Uh, we have the dissolution, of course, as a gas, and then we have, this is dissolved. And uh, we can see a trend that uh, in these 20 years, 30 years of data in the Pacific and also in the Atlantic, we can see some changes about 0 0.005 units, okay? And 30 years. And then you can imagine which kind of techniques you need to be able to measure trends like that. Okay, we go there. Some effects we have in the 
in the chemistry of the carbon system. Of course, we know that if we are working in the ocean acidification is because we are thinking in the effect of the anthropogenic releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, absorbing the 25% in the ocean, and because the, we have this absorption of the CO2, this CO2 is acid, weak acid, and then this is hydrated and become to uh, carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid, because the pH of the ocean, we release protons, and some of the protons also fit in the, in the carbonate, and we decrease the carbonate. We decrease the carbonate, we increase the bicarbonate, and we decrease the pH. And 30 years of data, we, are, we have the changes of 0 0.05, okay? For this effect, the range of the pH, you yeah, remember, the highest can be about 8.1, the lowest can be between, well, the lowest can be 7.3 or 7.4, the range is really small. This way in the, in the, in the in plot, the, when we have the range of the seawater, you can see the bicarbonate of the species more uh, with a higher concentration. Then we have the carbonate, and, we, then, and finally we have the, uh, the CO2. Then if we move to the more or less basic range, this means about 7.3 you can see the uh, very rapidly decrease in carbonate and the increase of CO2, okay? It's something that we care because, of course, we know that the carbonate is a species needed by the calcifiers. Okay, CO2 facts. We need to know that uh, photosynthesis removes CO2. Respiration increases CO2. And because we have these two processes, when we measure the pH, when we, when we have photosynthesis, we have up in the pH, or when we have respiration, we have this is down. And the first one, if we, if we think that uh, basically, the, or most of the phytoplankton, they use uh, a species more abundant that is uh, bicarbonate, they, they take the CO2 from this species and release OH. This OH, of course, this, they, uh, they increase the pH. But we, we have the opposite when we have respiration because the organic matter uses the oxygen and then release uh, CO2 and then we release uh, protons and the pH, pH decrease. And then we start to, think, to be thinking in different environments when uh, we don't have uh, low, when we have low or high photosynthesis or respiration, what I mean is the coastal areas or the oceanic areas when we, these processes are kind of uh, uh, less than we used to have in the, in the coastal ocean. And this is why we need to have some considerations about where we are planning to measure or where the data come from. Because this plot that you are looking, uh, uh, is the typical uh, plot when we have increase of CO2 because the anthropogenic impact, we have the increase in the atmosphere, we have the dissolution of the CO2 by absorption of the ocean, and we can see the decrease of the pH and uh, the prediction in, in 10 years from now to have the decrease to, to 0.4 units of pH. And when, then we are thinking, in, uh, we are uh, expecting a decrease of uh, 0.4 units in, uh, in, in this coming in hundred years. And you can observe this uh, tragic uh, plot when it's showing some decrease of the calcifiers. But there are some problems with this plot, with this figure, because it's confusing. And I, I, I'm going to talk about this because it's confusing, because it's a challenge too. It's, this is not real for the, uh, like that, for the coastal areas. And I'm going to show you some of the comparison we need to keep in mind to understand uh, uh, this message that I try to share with you. This, this is a, a very nice uh, plot, uh, work from Rachel Hosman that uh, she set up some seafets in, in oceanic areas, in coastal areas, in dwelling areas, and hydrothermal areas too. And I'm going to show you, for example, that uh, uh, 30 days 
of pH measurements in oceanic areas, in open ocean, in the Antarctic Ocean, you, you can observe the variability. It really, really, well, you, you cannot see able to see. I, I'm using glasses, but I, I, I don't see changes, uh, big changes on that. But when you compare, for example, from, with uh, versus abwelling areas on estuarine areas, you start to see changes uh, close to 0.4 units that we expect to see in the future 100 years. And then our coastal areas, uh, we have a very challenge with our coastal areas to try to understand how the ocean edification can be interpreted. We need a, a, a long time series on that. If we expect with this variability natural, it can be decreasing. I show you coral reef, kelp forest, all the thermal events. And then in all of them, it's just pH measurements. You, uh, as uh, a, per, uh, a researcher who wants to measure pH, where are you planning to, to set up your equipment? Which is your strategy? Which is your question? Where do data come from? Because based on that, you can uh, start to think in the strategy or start to think in which field the oceanification are you planning to be with. You can see in these next plots, there's a comparison of the ocean, the, the abwelling, the coral reef, the, uh, the variability, the rates of changes, but also the range and how the fluctuation of the pH is changing. And uh, it's basically what's the message that we observed in the previous, in the previous plot. Okay. Then this means that we need to have some considerations about the pH measurements across the different ecosystem. What do you want to ask you to the environment? Are you planning to see a trend with your data? You have a historical data, 30 days, 30 years of data that you are planning to join with the, to offer a message about a trend in an open ocean or in the coastal? Or you are planning, like most of the, the, the researchers, to start to be thinking in, uh, to us, to the ecosystem response. In maybe in uh, some uh, uh, mesocosm or in the ecosystem, where you are planning to set up a buoy or a pH uh, effect for a time series. Okay, all, all, I just try to, to invite you to be thinking and about your data that you have or, or the plan that you have in the future for now about the ocean education. In, in this respect, uh, several people have been thinking uh, to try to understand, to try to recommend for the many often question about which instrument, what I have to, to have, how I can measure, because in reality, the idea is you need to know or you need to be thinking that the question that you have need to be relative to the signal and no close to the to the noise to to ask to the to the environment and uh, you need to to have clear about the process you are you are trying to to be examined and and this is the goal and and uh, and then we we go or we jump to the to the topic of the uncertainty to help us to know which is my standard deviation of me my measurements that I'm using that or how with my equipment that I have in my lab with my electrode with my system, with my total quality system, uh, how would I'm able to measure which is my standard deviation? Because based on that, uh, we, we will see, we can move to, to be able to measure a trend or, or maybe our equipment just give us the opportunity to measure in an environment with fluctuation like we have that cosa. Okay, and then what measure technique you should, uh, you should have for to measure OA, or in which parameter you, you, should I choose to measure uh, OA? And in this respect, the term, in, the term uncertainty uh, is a very appropriate for quality and for the purpose that we have, because this gives us the opportunity to compare uh, India measurements with Brazilian measurements when we know the uncertainties of our equipment, we are able to give us a, a confident place, give us the opportunity to uh, assess 
the comparability of different measurements. And this is why the uh, GOAN, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, invite to all the community to, to, uh, to have this in mind. Doesn't matter that the, the, the brand that you have is a radiometer, Orion, doesn't matter about that. It's which is the uncertainty that you have. And they divide in two groups. And they did an analogy, terminology adopted by atmospheric science. A group of people who want to measure in a climate, this means to be able to assess the long trend. I want to know if uh, the pH is decreasing in my coastal, okay? You have all the equipment with a good accuracy and good precision to assess the long term, you are on this team. But see, your interest is to measure uh, with a quality enough just to identify spatial patterns, short-term variability, uh, to want to know the ecosystem response, local impact, uh, OA dynamic rapidly, okay? You are in the, in the team of the weather. And what you need for these teams, okay? For the team of the quality climate, you need to be able to work with the uncertainties and pH about 0 0.003. This means that you need to have a spectrophotometric, a colometric uh, system for DIC, a uh, potentiometric automatically, minus plus two, or, or PCO2, you have a buoy, okay? That's what you need to be working on that and to be able to see the trend of the absorption of the CO2 uh, by anthropogenic emissions. You, you, you can be in this team, if you, you have this equipment, or you can publish your data that you have, and you have this uh, inserted in that. But if you are, or you want to be in the weather team, you want to measure in the ecosystem, you can to set up a change of response in the, in the environment, the coastal, Okay, what you need is just 0.02 in pH, minus plus in total alkalinity and DAC, 10 micromolars, 2.5% in PCO2. And with this one, you are able to be publish your story that you are planning. The question that you have answers based on this equipment that you have, you will be able to work on that. Okay, basically what you need about the techniques. And, uh, Basically, this is what you, I invite you to be thinking for the future uh, measurement that you have. And I'm going to tell you a little story about, uh, uh, for example, people who are able to have some instrument working uh, in the surface water to be doing some time series. Uh, people can, you only have pH, for example you maybe can be able to get values, estimate values of alkalinity based on uh, the salinity. But of course, you need to validate. The, the nice part of the alkalinity is you basically, well, this, this, this uh, parameter is not uh, affected by the uh, CO2 absorption because you basically it's anions that you have available there, borates, silicate, phosphate, silic uh, uh, bicarbonate and carbonate, basically what you need. And uh, the alkalinity can be obtained by salinity, but you need to validate, again, uh, the values of that. For example, uh, Kitak League offered this nice plot where based on just salinity, you can estimate by equations the alkalinity. Maybe here the, the error can be about minus plus uh, 20 micromolars, but you can get this first uh, variable and to put together with pH measurements and to see a trend. I'm going to tell you a little more about that. For example, uh, Todd Marks in uh, Monterey Bay, they did this uh, nice comparison of pH uh, just to uh, using the honey, the Durafet, uh, and also they estimate pH using the PCO2 and uh, alkalinity using that salinity temperature. Um, but they, they have these empiric equations uh, in, in the coastal areas they were working on. It. They, they offer in this paper that is nice, it's for 2011, 
there are several nice guys like Sara, uh, De Campre, uh, Todd Martz, Gernot, very, uh, Kenny Johnson, a uh, very people involved in that develop of that technician, the different techniques. And they basically, they did a comparison of uh, pH, uh, direct measurements of pH with the potentiometric using the, the DuraFET and PCO2 with a buoy. And you can see how they, in black, the pH can be as high as 8.3. And the PCO2 is like a mirror, basically, in all the trend. You can see that the temperature because they have a well in these areas and then are where normally they, they, they expect uh, pumping CO2 when they have low temperature and of course they, they have the opposite of low pH. Okay, they did this experiment with this measurement directly, but what I want to show you is they, they were playing with the salinity calculated, mostly again, is the alkalinity calculated by salinity based on uh, 20,000 uh, data of PCO2 and DIC observation, and they developed these equations. As uh, you can see, they developed their own equation nearby Monterey Bay. And with this equation validated, they calculate, of course, by salinity, the alkalinity. This means that if they have only pH, with this equation, they can calculate PCO2 and they, well, they can calculate the soft organic carbon. And this is what they did. They did. You can see a, an overlapping of the uh, PCO2 uh, in black measures and red, the PCO2 calculated using pH and alkalinity calculated by salinity. And also DAC, okay? And then uh, you can play with this data. If you have data uh, from pH, uh, you need to be maybe working, you need to be working to develop this equation, this empirical equation to calculate uh, alkalinity. Another nice exercise they did was to be playing with DIC calculations based again in pH, PCO2, or pH, and alkalinity calculated by salinity, or also DIC calculated by the ratio from Redfield uh, using nitrate measurements that uh, they, they use using a, a SUNA equipment. They use the ratio 6.6 .6 to calculate the CO2. The problem is if you have oligotrophic water, you're going to get just zero. And then you need to give, be careful about that. And then basically they, they plot the differences between this calculation and you can see yes, most of them are minus plus 20, except the DIC calculated by pH and PCO2. Apparently, they have some uh, uh, effect of the organisms on the, on the sensors. The, the, the nice part of this, when you have uh, underway real-time measurements in the coastal and also the possibility to calculate alkalinity, of course, you can calculate aragonite saturation in the calcite. And this is nice because uh, if uh, part of the challenge, the questions that we have, that we are scary about the decrease of carbonate in the coastal areas when we have the aquaculture, or when we have uh, fisheries, or when we have a uh, coral reef, if you have these tools, pH and time series, and you can calculate the uh, total alkalinity by salinity, these two variables do it and make possible to calculate using the CO2 system, the calcite and aragonite. Okay, uh, this uh, almost just, uh, just finished. Uh, this last message from Todd Marx, uh, he was here in Ensenada, and he, in, in one, one of the plots from all World Ocean Circulation Experiment, uh, share the variability complete of the different ocean but also in, uh, in the left, by climatology, it's possible to see the pH mean or the pH annual by the amplitude or how the, the pH is decreasing per year and which areas is more affected. And there are a, a, a nice submission because uh, historical data in reality uh, is, uh, is very hard to tell us the, inter the entire story. 
uh, basically the coastal because as I showed you, it's very hard and we, we don't have really long time series in the coastal areas. But uh, on the other hand, the sensor in reality in this moment is the only way to characterize the region of the high variability. The coastal zone are the areas of high variability and, and uh, the people who is working on it have a very uh, challenge to develop data. I think it's the area where we have the, the big hunger. Then the, 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 the considerations uh, about the pH measurements across the system is uh, we need to be thinking again the question, we want to see trends, ecosystem, we want to set up instruments, or the data that we have available, where they come from. Because uh, I hope uh, after this talk, you be able to be thinking at least to see if your data can be applied for the trends or can be applied for ecosystem response. But first, of course, you need to be sure about the quality. Uh, uh, just remember that the different ecosystem that we have in the coastal, uh, uh, doesn't matter if you want to see a trend, ecosystem, or uh, to, to study changes and response, we have a big challenge because it's the area of very high variability. And then uh, uh, we need to be thinking as a homework that uh, we need to put data basically in our coastal zone. I don't have bullets for that, but I want to say just uh, thanks for this opportunity and uh, I hope this uh, message be uh, kind of clear. And uh, of course, you can ask me by my email in case that you can see that I can offer to you some, some advice. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ayon. Very interesting topic. Um, I am opening for questions now. However, I have a, another commitment downstairs and I will give uh, Adriana, the coordinator of the project, uh, so she can uh, mediate questions. So for now, uh, does anyone have a question? Feel free to open your mic or you can write it on the chat if you feel more comfortable in uh, asking in, in Spanish. It's uh, also <laughs> welcome, any kind of question. Thank you, Lydia. Yes, of course, Kyla, please. If you, if you prefer, you can unmute. Ah, okay, so you just uh, write it on the chat, yes. So a uh, question uh, to Martin from Luis Antonio Cuevas. With current pH coastal data sets available, do you think it's possible to estimate ocean acidification effects on coastal ecosystems if these ecosystems are so variable in pH units? Well, part of my, my recommendation is uh, because you have a local impact and rapid changes. And in coastal with high variability, uh, at least you, you, you need to, to have, uh, we will see 10 years of data to see fluctuations, but also you need to be careful about the changes of the oceanography nearby to these coastal areas to try to understand which processes are affecting or changing or promoting the changes of QH. But uh, this is why it's difficult to be talking about oceanification with in the hand for the coastal, because in reality, you need to have a uh, long term of data for the coastal. Okay, uh, next question by Carla Bergo. What do you recommend to the project members to tackle first? 
again, could you repeat? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, what do you recommend to the project members to tackle first? pH sensors or in situ? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as I explained at the beginning, uh, I showed you two kind of equipment, spectrophotometric and also uh, potentiometric techniques. The nice part of the, the I, I like the part of the potentiometric because it's easy to deal with. Of course, they have some problems that you need to be familiar. But with the spectrophotometric, you need some, you need just to take some samples every two weeks. If you are thinking to left your instrument for three months and to be able to validate, right? And, and uh, in reality, you need, you need these two instruments for that. You need to validate, one for validate, and the other one to be measuring in real time. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, here, uh, people, everyone. Um, I am Adriana Gonzalez from Mexico. I am not. I am now the host because Lika has had to leave. Um, I want to um, ask me uh, ask uh, Martin a question from Francisco Navarrete Mier. Uh, he said, uh, "Well, we need to measure pH in the field, but we cannot bring the equipment." Which is the best option to sample and then measure in in lab? Well, the, the before we have these uh, uh, real time instruments, we used to have our electrode and our ball meter, right? Uh, we start like that, and then uh, the only problem with that is you need to be collecting samples. Uh, depending on the question that you have, if you are working in a coastal area and you want to see the effect of the, the tide, of course, you need to be taking samples each hour, right? And uh, here depends of the, uh, of the question that we have. Uh, we want to see the variability, uh, uh, depend the scale that you are planning to, to, to measure, because depend the scale that you want to, to see the effects on your variable, is the way that you need to make your, your strategy. If you want to see yeah, only uh, spatial variability, of course, you can take a sample, discrete samples along a coastal, uh, along the uh, coastal lagoon, and to see how they uh, are changing in the inner and the old and the more uh, nearby oceanic area. Uh, all depend on the question. And, and for Francisco Navarrete, I, I can offer my advice in case that he he's planning to to make a some sampling in, in a special area. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, I have some short question here from Carla. Um, pH sensors are in situ. Um, maybe Carla is a continuation of his of her previous question. I think that the question from some of them is okay it's already been answered thanks adriana okay carla is okay um we are waiting for another question is if anyone wants to ask martin about something else mm, well uh, i think that uh, it is important to point out that um, Martin is talked about very interesting and important points um, that everyone have to take in account for working or for those who are working in the generation of long time series for pH and acidification studies and uh, all uh, other variables that have to be taken in account to uh, uh, keep in mind change that are going on in the oceans uh, worldwide. Um, if you have more questions, here we are, and if not... Well, if there is no more questions, um, I want to thank Dr. Martin Hernandez-Ayon for his very interesting speech. 
Uh, I want all, all, uh, also to thank all the participants that were here with, with us. Okay, well, here we have another question um, okay. from Kanita Utaipan. Um, thank you so much, Martin. And the question is, do you have any idea for the interaction between the ocean acidification that induced by the hypoxia? Well, uh, this is an interesting topic too, because we have areas uh, where we have the oxygen minimal zone. And this area where we have oxygen minimal zone, the, the, the process of respiration is, is very high. And uh, this has, people are considering these areas as the future window of the ocean acidic. Uh, uh, for example, we have in Mexico, just in the tropical area, we have our oxygen minimal zone. And just in uh, 100 meters or maybe less, 70 meters, below of 70 meters, we have undersaturated uh, carbonate. Oh, this means that, I, that, that we, we don't have the enough carbonate uh, uh, needed for calcifier, calcifiers. We have an, a very short uh, area, just the combination of low oxygen, zero, but very low pH, very high DIC, very high PCO2. And then we start to be thinking in this area like a multi-stressor, multi natural multi-stressor. Multi then there are a very nice uh, environment, natural environment, where is the circulation, who is feeding this, this low, a slow circulation is feeding this, uh, remove the, this uh, oxygen minimum zone, or people are thinking also the high productivity where the organic matter is so high that, uh, but that what is moving is too low, that uh, the, is decreasing because the respiration of the organic matter. There are many questions about that. Peru, Venezuela, uh, uh, Mexico, uh, this, we have this kind of environment where uh, we are talking about uh, multi-stressors, low oxygen and low pH2. Thank you, Martin. Um, we have another question here from Celeste Sanchez. She asked about the trees buffers. When it's not possible to purchase the trees buffer, do you recommend the use of a, of a home prepared one? Uh, I, I, I invite you to do, to do that because the recipe is in the book. Uh, Andrew Dixon offered a recipe. It's not so friendly, the, the recipe, but uh, I invite you to try to do it. Uh, a second option that you have is uh, the certificate reference material, the typical for alkalinity and DIC. This bottle, you have DIC and you have the alkalinity and you have the salinity, and then you can calculate the pH and then the, with this certificate reference material, you can also uh, use as a pH buffer, right? Or, or you can prepare a substandard water. So you have a, a alkalinity and DIC system validated by CRM. You can also prepare to have uh, two choices, the certificate reference material and use the substandard two uh, for, with two pH. And there are, then uh, the, you have uh, two choice, two options additional to, to validate your pH measurements. Okay, Martin, here is some question from Carla. Um, how about using trees buffers with different salinities? Okay. Okay, well, the, the buffer, the three buffers coming from Dixon is, I think is only one salinity value. But uh, I try to understand the question from Carla. Uh, I suppose uh, that she's getting sampled with different salinities. Yes, I hope so. Yes, in reality with your, with your three buffer, you validate your system, your instrument. You say, okay, I add in this water who have this salinity and who have this proton ratio. And uh, I want to know if my equipment is okay. And then uh, and I, I start to do that, okay? But uh, the, the tree buffer have a range where it's valid. I think it's valid for between 33 and 37. 
and then it might be okay. I, I think there are no problem for that, unless you are using less salinity for est estuaries, maybe. Yes, estuaries. Well, Argentina, they are near a very big estuary. I suppose that Carla is uh, thinking about that. Yes, and, and this. Uh, 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 in this case, uh, of course, you need to be careful about to use which constants. I suggest to use the Milleros constant uh, that are using for uh, uh, estuaries from lower salinities from estuaries to the ocean. This is one suggestion I, I can uh, offer to her and to use the trees too and uh, uh, CRMs. I, I, I offer to Carla to, to be careful using uh, at least two uh, ways to validate the data. When you have almost fresh water, of course, you can use the MBS to, to, to validate your, your, your measurements. Uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge when you have a, an estuary, but be careful with the constants that you are using. And uh, I think you, I, because I know that you have an alternative system and uh, you have PCO2 system too, because I know in Argentina they have these equipment. And I'm not sure that you have now DIC measurements that you can also to be collecting samples. Okay, thank you, Martin. I have here only, well, a comment from Carla. Uh, she said that they, she used trees for validate her data and for the PK, PK2, of the M Creso. I don't know if Martin wants to add something else about that. Um, I, I, I I miss this part of the PK2. Uh, you try to to measure the alkalinity with the spectrophotometric because uh, in uh, for the Cresol are you using only two PKs, I think, more close to the pH eight and not two, but I, I, I miss this part. But uh, in case uh, she can bring me to be sure about this uh, recipe she's using and, and we can offer more advice about that. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yes, uh, um, here we have a comment from Stella Betancourt from Colombia. She recommends uh, that in in the future, um, it is important or it will be important to consider a workshop or some practical instruction about these measurements because these methodologies need special implementation. I think that uh, Estella is right. Uh, I am. I want to know if Martin, do you have something else to add about that? Well, the nice part of Estella, she going to send us a. a, a a person that is working with her. She, uh -huh. She's right, she's right. But uh, we are waiting this guy who will be as part of her love, that he will be here in, in December. And uh, we hope to be helping on that. But it's true, and in reality, uh, uh, La OCA, the Latin American Ocean Certification, uh, offer just a couple of uh, conference and, and workshops uh, and I understand we, we need more, and uh, I offer my love, of course, to be able to have a, a workshop here. Of course, we need to just to to book and to uh, uh, to get the financial to be able to to move people from uh, another part of the Latin America to be here. But I still offer my uh, advice, of course, no problem. The people know me, uh, all the people who's asking. Uh, we are. We have some relationship with the with the CO two system, <laughs> the CO two system lab. Okay, thank you. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, well, if there is um, no more questions, I well, I will finish the meeting. Uh, I again we thank Martin for his speech and for everyone who participated. Um, 
please, of course, feel free to send Martin any email if you have any questions, some specific questions about uh, all his speech or about pH measurements. Uh, this is open to continue the communication. Well, I thank uh, Martin again and everyone for the participation in the meeting. This is another uh, speech. The others are going to continue and we want to see you in future uh, webinars. Thank you very much and have a nice day and weekend.